Hello, and welcome to Community Voices, where we talk to Humboldt County's movers and shakers. Paul's guest today is Karen Paz Dominguez, Auditor Controller of Humboldt County. And now here's your host, Paul Versu. Hello, and welcome to Access Humboldt's Community Voices. I'm your host, Paul Brissou. Today, our guest, Karen Paz Dominguez, the Auditor Controller of Humboldt County. And Karen, right as we start, can you explain what an Auditor Controller is? Yes. Uh, thank you for letting me be here today, and I will try to condense it as much as I can. As you can imagine, it's a big job. The Auditor Controller represents two different functions. It's two separate jobs combined into one. The Auditor part is reviews everything after the fact. After everything's been posted and paid, the Auditor Stop retroact- what What is yeah. everything? Uh, oh, uh, transactions. So payments, bills, journal entries to move money around, uh, cash transfers. And that's what I mean when I say everything. And that uh, is the county, correct? Yes. Uh, the auditor controller does work for the county, but they don't just service the county. They also service special districts and schools districts, as well as private taxpayers. Uh, the so the auditor does the retroactive review to make sure that accounts were posted correctly, the amounts were uh, correct, everything is authorized. The controller serves more as a real-time internal control reviewer, so making sure that the fund, the public's funds are well protected, that they're reducing the risk of theft and loss and fraud. And the, that's the gist of what the auditor controller does and represents. Let me ask, there's an auditor controller for every county in California? There are 58 counties and I believe as of now there's 54 auditor controllers. The other counties that don't have auditor controllers have chosen to instead have appointed positions so they don't have an elected office and those are directors of finance. And that's my next question. You are an elected official? Yes, I am. And then when did you start your current term? January 7th, 2019. And how long does that term last for? It's a four-year term. Now, let me ask an important question. I get it. I understand how people run for offices like city council or supervisor or congressperson. How do you get interested in running for the office of auditor controller? Well, uh, it kind of just happens to you because I can <laughs> tell you that when you go to school and you choose accounting as your uh, special focus or your major, you're not thinking that you're going to be led to any kind of public appearances, being on TV, to doing interviews. There's no fame associated with studying accounting. Uh, <laughs> my dream job, I've shared this before with other people, was to just be left alone in a room with a calculator and a pencil. You know, that was the dream. Uh, it just so happened that in government uh, work, the this position is elected for this county. And so I ran thinking uh, it would be just doing the auditing and the accounting. I didn't know how exciting and dramatic the public aspect of it was going to be. Well, there was a swing and a miss. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's a it's a campaign and uh, you sign up to go ahead and run. You do you campaign like a normal official? Not necessarily, because this position doesn't set policy. So it's not like a county supervisor that is making decisions that impact the lives of everybody and set policies and rules. Uh, it's interesting. I think the elected auditor controller, from my perspective, is meant to serve the public independently of the other elected offices and appointed offices. And so where we act as the watchdog of public funds, we have to have that independence where we can't be influenced or directed by any other body. Uh, and so we answer only to the electorate. 
And that's why it's an elected position instead of an appointed position, because you don't have elected officials directing you as what to do. You are independent of them uh, since you're doing the auditing, right? Yes. And uh, I answer to the public and the public has their opportunity to assess my performance every four years in elections. Now, when you say you answer to the public, how much does the public pay attention to the work of your office? Prior to me taking this position, I've, well, I've been told that not much. That the public was not aware that this was an elected office, that uh, we were there for them. A lot of people still don't really know what I do. Uh, since taking this position, I have been on the news a couple of times, and it's gotten a lot of attention. So now we're getting more engagement from the public. They're emailing us more often. They're calling more often, asking questions questions about our office and what they can expect from us. In your relation to the public, what would you tell the public of how I serve you? I serve them by adhering to all the laws and regulations that govern my office. And so the best way that I can avoid lawsuits and the public's money being wasted or lost is by adhering to accounting rules meant to protect public funds and the integrity of the transactions, uh, keeping up to date with the Internal Revenue Service, with all other federal agencies and their mandates for us. The best way that I can serve the public is by making sure that our county is adhering to those laws so that we avoid lawsuits. Um, also making sure that if a department, a county department or a special district is acting outside of the law, we can reel them back in uh, and make sure that the county treasury isn't threatened with any litigation either. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. People need to realize that it's their money that you're looking after. For the most part, yes. And then when you say uh, a district uh, maybe overstepping its bounds, you're simply talking about that your job is there to look at if a district overstepped its bounds in the spending arena, correct? Yes. Um, because we live in such a rural area, we don't have, we don't enjoy the stability of having long-term special district employees. Most of our special districts are volunteer run. Um, they don't function with huge budgets. And so when you have a high level of turnover with volunteers, you lose a part of the training and the institutional knowledge. And so sometimes they will make this, the districts will make decisions or will direct their volunteers to do something that is based upon outdated laws and might not be aware that new laws have come into place that may be restrict them a little bit more, or even give them more options. And so when you say restricted, yeah. you, meant, you mean restricted in how they can use the public's money that their district or agency has? Yes. Yes. Well, wouldn't that be uh, an incredible full-time job just to keep up with the, the changing uh, criteria of which how money can be spent? Yes, it is a big job, and uh, that is why one of the requirements to serve as the auditor controller is that we complete uh, continuing professional education hours. Every year we are expected to keep up with our training, keep up with uh, all laws and regulations, because they are constantly changing. How much so training? So I will be a forever student. How much training is that? I'm sorry. Um, oh, shoot. I think it's 40 hours every two years. 40, 40 hours of continuing professional education. And you too, or maybe they used to send you, but does, does the, um, the county make time for you to get that training? Are you the only one in the office that has to get that training? I'm the only one required by statute to have the training, but everyone in my office does regularly participate in that continuing professional education. Uh, we, uh, our members of several organizations like the CalSACA, that's the California State Association of County Auditors, they put out a, a lot of trainings throughout the year. They're usually webinars, two to three hour trainings. Uh, the State Controller's Office also puts out trainings and annual meetings. Those are more, you know, two days long. Uh, and I don't go by myself. I usually bring a, a coworker with me, the assistant auditor controller, or any of the other accountants. We're 
what, that's one of our top priorities is keeping up to date. How much guidance do you get from the state? <laughs> a lot. They are always telling us what to do. Uh, they, <laughs> they require that we submit reports to them of information. And so those reports come with requirements and how often you have to do them, what kind of information needs to be shared. They also act as the intermediary between us and the federal government. So sometimes the federal government will say, here are the laws this year. The state then becomes the enforcer. And so they expect us to know those federal laws, but then also we adhere to the state's version of those laws. And so we're, we're always getting direction from the state. Interesting. Is, is your job, uh, are you involved with actually obtaining any money from the state or from uh, the federal government? Yes. So departments in the, in the county can apply for grants. Um, they are also recipients of mandated monies like CalFresh, CalWorks, where the state government is giving them money to operate those programs. And where the auditor controller comes into play is at the end of a period where they have to send their reports to the state. They said, you gave us this much. We spent this much. The auditor controller then has to certify that that is true. And so we go and review all of the transactions, the postings, the money that came in, the money that went out, and we certify that, yes, this is true. And so that is a part we play in getting money in. Now, do you have contact? Do you talk with other uh, controllers around the state? Yes. Through our association, we have regional groups. Uh, we, you know, it's apples to oranges from county to county. We are not comparable to, say, L.A. County. They got tons of money. And so we're part of the Northern Region Auditor Controllers. And we do have annual meetings. I do uh, speak with them. We email. We have a little email group going every every month. We check in. And our partnering, our neighboring counties would be Shasta, Tehama, Lake, Butte, Trinity, Del Norte. Those are in our little cohort. Now, and then there... in February, we have our next meeting. There you go. Are there any controllers that you've met that just get to sit in a room with their pencil and their calculator and figure it out? No, no. <laughs> we are all very active in public engagement. Yeah. So if that's the case, how do we get people to become auditor controllers in the future? Oh, well, outreach, letting them know that this job exists. Uh, make incentivizing it as a county too, saying, hey, look at this great opportunity that you have. Look at all the you know, people you can meet and the way that you can serve your community and still have a job. I was just talking more of the, the people that go through a county programs in colleges and maybe want a lower profile job. And here's an elected job that's an outstanding job within their field. And yet, as you say, it's not quite the uh, seclusion, let's say, that you had wanted to have. Yeah, definitely not as the auditor controller, but you can be a governmental accounting and be an accountant and be under the radar. So... Is this something that, uh, as you're an auditor controller, what goes on from here? Do you run for other terms? Are there other jobs within the state that auditor can, is there a, I guess what I'm saying, is there a, a series of progression of jobs that exist for auditor controllers as they uh, are in their profession? Uh, I've seen that other elected officials in you know state positions they all started somewhere else somewhere like a you know mayor of a city or some other elected position with auditor controllers that that unless you have those political aspirations there's really nowhere else you need to go uh, this is a perfectly satisfactory position and uh, running for re-election every four years that's it's kind of like a staff evaluation. You'd have to do it in a regular job anyway. Had you ever run for any political office before you became the auditor controller? No, no. <laughs> and did you have uh, uh, an interest, let's say, in, in politics or local governing uh, as a young person? No, <laughs> I really just wanted to do accounting. And uh, the life before accounting was music. I played trombone. And so I just went from playing with a band to playing with accountants. What band did you play with? 
uh, well, I came to HSU on a music scholarship, and oh. I played with the jazz orchestra, the Humboldt uh, Symphony, the symphonic band. That was a whole other life ago. Do you still play your trombone? Oh, who's got the time? Who's got the time? No. <laughs> so, oh, an effect of having this job has kept you away from playing music? Yeah, it, it's a big job. And for a long time, we our office has been, it's just been 10 of us. And so every available minute has been just trying to keep up with the rest of the county that's growing around us. Luckily, though, just this week, the board voted to give us two new positions. And so I can already see, like, oh, I'm going to get a day off. Maybe I'll you know, bring out my trombone again. I hope you bring Play a couple trombone. notes. <laughs> I did uh, read that your office did go from uh, 10 to 12. And the necessity of that is to expedite some of these uh, uh, audits that need to uh, occur? Yes, yes. Uh, it, it, I don't feel like those two new positions will be everything we'll ever need forever. It will definitely help stabilize our department. Right now, it's if one person is out sick, everyone is scrambling to cover. Uh, we rely very heavily on our 10 people. With 12, we'll have a little bit more wiggle room where we can start looking under those rocks that we haven't looked under yet. Uh, and also training more, not just within our department, but cross-training other fiscal staff across the county. We'll be able to focus more on uh, policies and procedures, having instructional documents. I want to modernize the office and offer more electronic services. I want to make information more accessible to the public where they don't need to go to the courthouse to get information. Maybe they can just click on a website and get all of our financial reports. I mean, that's the goal, and we just needed time to do that. Now, let me ask a, a couple of questions in relation to our current situation. How has COVID made the job more difficult for you at this, or has it at this time? Um, well, it's because we are a central service provider, meaning we are giving services to districts, schools, districts, and uh, departments, we depend on them. So if a department is experiencing turnover or delays, that means we're experiencing that too. And because we are right in the middle of operations where, you know, we have to get deposit records from the treasurer's office in order to distribute money on this end, and we need this first before we can give that every, you know, any delay anywhere is going to impact operations. On the other hand, we have, we're actually well equipped to transition into electronic and remote work at the start of the pandemic because of the power outages we had in October of 2019. When PG&E shut off our power, they did it on the worst possible day for our office. It was <laughs> payroll Wednesday. We had to issue payroll for 2,500 employees and all the power was out. And now we learned real quick, like we cannot be dependent on power. How do we become sustainable if everything we do is on computers? So we started investing in laptops and we started scanning all of our documents, make it accessible online so that we can you know, go to another city that has electricity and maybe do our work from there. It was those PG&E power shutoffs that made us start working to modernize and make things as electronic as possible. So when COVID hit and we had to be remote, several of us were already prepared to do it. We had our laptops, we had our information stored on the network. And the only delay we experienced was in getting more laptops because everybody was trying to buy laptops all at the same time. There and, you go. Yeah. There are a lot of things that uh, people are learning, uh, obviously, through this. I mean, even us conducting an interview this way, how life has changed in that sense. What about has accounting changed at all? Are there new monies that come in? Are there new regulations that are strictly uh, related to COVID that have changed accounting and auditing? Uh, there were, so there's GASB, that's the Government Accounting Standards Board. They are the ones that issue pronouncements to government entities every year telling us of what accounting changes we need to implement. What COVID uh, did is delayed those. So GASB took pity on us and said, okay, we knew we had all these changes coming. 
you're obviously dealing with a pandemic as we are, will delay implementation. So it gave us a little bit of breathing room. Um, the new regulations are more tied with CARES Act funding. So all the government entities that got money through that CARES relief package, now they have to learn new reporting infrastructures and allowable expenses. And that's the new one, but it it's not permanent. Because we will get out of expenses. Uh, I did read uh, the article regarding the board meeting the other day, and it said that those two new workers would be uh, in a limited duration. Are you concerned, and I guess other government workers concerned, uh, about uh, the disruption of the tax flow during COVID and what offices will be staffed like in the future uh, toward the end of your term? I think that's been a concern for all county departments every year because there's always been something to threaten the sustainability of tax revenues. Uh, you know, the <laughs> yeah, like the housing crash 2007, 2008, that made people start looking at their budgets. Uh, when Prop 13 was passed and limited the amount of uh, taxes you can place on a parcel, that made people look at their budgets again. Um, I will share with you that the board voted to make those positions permanent. Uh, they there was recommended to be limited term and they they heard us when we said it's not a limited term need we're going to need this staff and we also in order to incentivize accountants coming we need to give them something more than temporary especially because of the level of skill required in these jobs um, every year the board has the option to reduce its labor force or increase its labor force. So even the jobs that are permanent, there's no guarantee that in the next budget process, the board won't determine that, you know what, we need to tighten our spending. Maybe some of these jobs will need to be furloughed. I mean, that was something that was discussed at the start of the pandemic. Given all that's gone on in California, and people may be deciding that they want to change where they live or, or you know, relocate because of a variety of reasons. Is it harder or easier to get people, qualified people, to fill jobs now? Before the pandemic, it, for us, it was harder because our local accountant pool is limited. Everyone's already working at CPA firms or in their private businesses. But because of the pandemic and our remote work options, we were actually able to recruit somebody from another county. And uh, we, she was working with us for, uh, I think, nine months while she w lived in Butte County. Now she's moved over to Humboldt County. So it's a good, it's the Zoom and the electronic format of remote work has allowed us to expand our pool of candidates. Uh, it's, it's a positive result. It's been a positive. And, and are other counties finding that around the state? I'm not sure. Uh, not many counties are hiring right now for these positions. It's just interesting to see how these times affect uh, our local government. Um, well, I uh, anything you'd like to add? I kind of uh, have exhausted a couple of questions that I had, and uh, you were taking me down some uh, uh, good inquiries there. Uh, is this something you see yourself running for re-election and doing in the future? It has always been a passion of mine to be in the service of the public. Uh, it was happenstance that I landed here, but I am glad that I'm here. And if the public is willing to have me, I am willing to keep serving. Uh, it is their best interest that is at the forefront of everything that we do. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for answering those questions about how your job relates to the public. Bringing an awareness of local government and what it does for the public is very important. So thank you for being a guest uh, today on Community Voices. And uh, we appreciate the work you do. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. This has been Community Voices. with your host, Paul Bursu. Thank you for joining us. If you represent a nonprofit organization and are interested in being a guest on Community Voices, send an email to info at or call 
476-1798. Axis Humboldt, local voices through community media.